Well, I'm going to make it easy for you again. Uh, one chapter today, and I'm not leaving it. So I'd like it if you'd open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We'll be sticking here <clears throat> the whole time. But I will tell you, I'm going to put some verses up here that are from another passage. But for where, And you guys are welcome to go there if you want. But Acts 2, if you want to follow along, we'll be there the whole time. So this is probably the quickest I've ever preached six sermons in three days. Uh, <clears throat> I like it because it's concentrated and stuff's still fresh in your mind. Sometimes by the end of a week-long meeting, you kind of like forget what was in the first lesson. Um, but I hate that it's so short because it's, it's been enjoyable to be with you. Um, and I, I like having the chance to, to visit with brethren. We're only, it was 23 minutes with no traffic today. Uh, we're not that far away, but sometimes we are so busy with our lives and our own work and things like that, that we, um, we don't make connections as often as we should. So, uh, I'm going to try to do better. And, uh, I'm, I'm thankful that there's a good church here in Hammond, uh, doing the Lord's work. And I just want to thank you guys again for your commitment to the Lord and, and for asking me to, to share with you today. The whole goal of this meeting is to be providing different ways to sum up the story, a summary of the story, to, to break it down, to, to put it in a way that, <clears throat> as we talked about last night, you could share it in a road trip, or you could share it in two verses, or you could share it in three chapters, or just simple ways to think about the gospel, to not get so worked up in our mind that this is so difficult that, that I, I can't do it, that I need a 12, you know, 12 lesson series and, uh, you know, these different, you know, movies or film strips or whatever back in the day they used to use. You don't need all this complicated stuff. You need the simple message of the truth. Now, there are a lot of other things to teach and sometimes people need some unlearning. I, I get it. And sometimes people need some time to come to the faith. But I believe that every Christian should get to the point where they can present what they believe in a sitting. Uh, and maybe it's not super convincing. Your goal is not to convert somebody every time you have a convert or a conversation. <clears throat> Another one of books that I, I don't always recommend books, like I said, but I will give you one more recommendation today. There's a book called Tactics by a guy named Greg Kokel. And he says the goal of most of your conversations is not a conversion but to what, do what he says is put a stone in somebody's shoe. Now, my baby likes to put toys in shoes now. <laughs> you, you can't go very far without stopping to deal with it. The, the kids play at recess and they get wood chips in their shoes. You can't go very far before you're going to stop and shake out your shoe and get that wood chip out. It bothers you, right? The goal sometimes of sharing the gospel is you give someone enough of a nugget to think about it's not going to be too long. they got to stop and think about what you just said. And let the, let the word do its work. The seed sometimes takes time. But put that seed in, and God does the rest. So don't, don't make yourself uh, so scared that you can't share the gospel. Uh, I want to revisit Acts 2, a, a chapter that a lot of churches of Christ we, we talk about all the time, but we seem to only cherry-pick one or two verses. And we miss the whole broader context of this. But I'm going to give you one uh, section from John to kind of point towards what's going on in Acts 2. Then the, the, the passage with the woman in the well, and this should say verses 3 through 4, not 13 through 14, now that I see it up in, in print. I know if I ever preach this at Portage, now I can fix that. Uh, but everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I will give him shall never thirst. But the water I will give him become a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now, you may or may not know, but almost all of the sayings of Jesus, especially the seven I am statements, uh, and many more, come from the book of Isaiah. This comes from Isaiah chapter 55, where he says, Come drink water without cost. It's an invitation to get to know the Lord. His ways are above our ways, but he's come near so that you can know him. You can know the ways that are high above our ways. It's knowable. But it's made very clear later on in the book of John, John chapter 7, what does this mean? 
Because it still is kind of confusing. She was confused. She's like, hey, give me that water. That'd be great. I wouldn't have to come draw water every day. But Jesus says this, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He spoke, uh, but this he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive for the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. This sets up the timetable for what we're going to be talking about in Acts chapter 2. Uh, and so that's the context I want to give, but now we're going back. We're going back to Acts 2. We won't leave here again, I promise. <clears throat> I want to give you some background about Acts 2 because we're going to focus on Peter's sermon, but we want to talk about what's going on here. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, he had told them to gather in Jerusalem for the next step, right? Not to leave Jerusalem. What's coming next is going to happen then. It was basically about 10 days later after Jesus says, go wait in Jerusalem, that all the events we're going to talk about today happen. And so that's where the 120 were gathered in that upper room, right? Uh, so these 120 faithful followers, which includes the apostles, remember I said James, the Lord's brother, is now a convert, and, and all the Lord's brothers are there with Mary, and this 120, I'm sure Cleopas is probably there, that's always been my guess, uh, from the road to Emmaus. He seems like a guy that would be there. Uh, probably a bunch of the Marys in the Bible. The, the believers, right? This is the core. They're gathered together in one place. Now they've got a job to do first, because they've been waiting. They've got 10 days here. They're waiting for Jesus to do what he's going to do next. <clears throat> they appoint Matthias as the next apostle to, to fulfill Judas' place. So we got 12 again. There are 12 apostles and they're all waiting in Jerusalem in that upper room for what's going to happen. Starting in chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. Now it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Remember we had talked before, they thought Galileans were kind of the hillbillies, the, the uneducated, the, the blue-collar guys, they, they can't know it but they are fluently speaking in languages they've never studied before. How is it we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews, proselytes, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. We've got people from Africa, Asia, Europe, Middle East, all gathered in one place and one time, the many nations prophesied about in the Old Testament, hearing the apostles speak. And they're speaking in tongues. Known languages. I've had the experience of visiting apostolic and Pentecostal churches before where tongue speaking was something that was not just uh, believed in, but actively encouraged and participated in. Whether there was an interpreter or not, it, it was something that was a big part of their worship. Uh, but these were not like that. These are intelligible, understandable, actual human languages being spoken here. They say, hey, he's speaking my language back home. How does he know that? Isn't he from Galilee? Now, I, I can do this since I'm preaching. I'm going to skip to the end of the story. We'll go back, I promise. My brother used to actually tease me sometimes by reading the end of my book and telling me what happened. I, I, normally I don't like to spoil the story, but hopefully you already know how this is all going to end here. <clears throat> but look at the end. This is going to help us fill in what happens in the sermon. Acts 2, 37 through 40. Now when they heard this, that being the audience, who was listening all in their own language, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. 
With many other words, he solemnly testified, kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So that's his invitation. It's kind of funny, the, the dramatic way that he preaches, he brings you to the point where he says, you're all guilty. And he didn't finish it, <laughs> right? It, it's kind of like, we call it the mic drop moment. You guys put Jesus on the cross, and they, they believe it. We did, we put Jesus on the cross. What next? And so they're crying out, they're pierced to the heart, they're guilty. What do we do? Peter could have told him anything, but he told him, repent, that is change, and be baptized, be immersed. The stuff we've talked about throughout the week, we know what happens at baptism now after our studies. But I want to focus on this part. We as churches of Christ sometimes read this over and just skip over it, gloss over it, because I mentioned the Holy Spirit, and we just don't know much about him, and he's scary, we don't want to talk about him. Now, the Pentecostals will say this is the extra step of salvation. They believe that you need to hear and believe and repent and confess, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit to be saved. You know, members of churches of Christ usually will hold up five fingers, they hold up six, because that's, you need to, and until you get that Holy Spirit, you're not going to be saved. But what is going on there? That's the point we're going to seek to answer from the sermon today. So what is that promise? The promise for the children, meaning all of these represented who have a Jewish faith, and those who are far off. That would be not just distance, but also us. The promise to everybody who hears. Let, let's follow through it point by point. <clears throat> so uh, continuing in chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 12, they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? Others are mocking and saying they're full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice, declared to them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. It's morning. It's too early for that. That isn't going to happen. Um, he says, what is actually going on? This is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. It shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth the spirit and they shall prophesy. I'll grant wonders in the sky above, signs on the earth below, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he says, this is what Joel talks about. And I won't belabor the point. If you weren't here to hear our, our sermon before, uh, I talked about this the other night. But he says, this is what was prophesied. God promises salvation to those that would call on the Lord, right? That, that end of that prophecy, it shall be. The sign is the Holy Spirit being poured out and people speaking in prophecies and tongues and miraculous gifts, signs in the heavens. These kind of things are going to happen, but why? It wasn't just to impress the crowds. It wasn't just to say, hey, look what we can do. They loved the gift of tongues, by the way. People loved that because, wow, that's pretty impressive. I wish I could do that. He said, no, those are just so that you can get to the main point. The main point is verse 21. It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The prophet said, this stuff will happen so you know it's time to be saved. The question is, what does it mean to call on the Lord? How do I do that? And he's got to prove to them that, yeah, that's what the prophets really talked about. But this is the first point of the sermon. This comes about to fulfill that this is the time. This is now what Joel said was going to happen. But they might say, what, what, you're talking about this Jesus, and he died. How was that part of the plan? What kind of great leader, what kind of great king? Their, their movement is helped by their death. I wasn't alive to see uh, assassination of uh, Martin Luther King or JFK. You've got people who are leading a country in a direction, and they're very popular, people love them. What happens when their lives are ended tragically by their enemies? Chaos. And the direction they were headed in, I mean, 
they, things aren't the same. So people say, what do you mean? Jesus died. But notice, this is part of God's plan. He has to assure them of that. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. These are people who saw some of the miracles. Most everybody saw some of the miracles. And did you realize that the vast majority of Galileans had been baptized? Luke chapter 7 tells us that only the Jewish leaders refused baptism. Everybody else was baptized. They were ready in John's baptism, looking for the Messiah. They saw these miracles. It wasn't done in a corner, as Paul's going to say later on. These things weren't done in a corner, Agrippa. Everybody knew. He says, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan, foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Right? That's what we talked about. That was God's plan from the beginning, his foreknowledge in this lesson. You notice how the reason I save this one for the end, it ties together every single sermon we've done in this lectureship. God always planned for the miracle working Jesus to be put to death by your hands. That wasn't an accident. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't, oops, now I've got to recalculate and set up the church because his real plan is gone. No, that was the plan from the start. And every prophet's been talking about it. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he's at my right hand, so I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue exalted, Moreover, my flesh will also live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You've made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence, right? So it was prophesied that the Christ, the Messiah, the Chosen One, the King would be put to death by their hands despite his great miracle working but that Jesus would be raised again. And the prophets talked about it, and it wasn't just pretty clear ones like Isaiah 53, but I told you before about the stories of Elijah and Elisha with resurrections. You've got stories of new births, uh, just amazing things. The story of Abraham and Sarah having a kid is even considered a story of resurrection. And then Abraham and Isaac, when he had faith that God would somehow raise him up, is a story of belief in the resurrection. Over and over again, even Job himself, who knew even little, hardly anything, Job said, someday he'll face his Redeemer. There's these hints of the resurrection, but God's always been talking about it. By the way, it's even built into nature. I didn't really belabor that point in 1 Corinthians 15, but when you plant a seed in the ground, that seed dies, so new life comes. It's literally programmed into the Garden of Eden, resurrection. Because it's always been the plan. Now, I could see, here's where he goes the zinger. He's like, he anticipates they might be thinking, well, David wrote those Psalms. We know where David's grave is. And so he says, uh, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, he both died and was buried. His tomb was with us to this day. You passed by his tomb before. It was a monument. David's dead, so what's he talking about? Wasn't talking about himself. David's a corpse. Right? So because he was a prophet and he knew God swore to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Remember, we talked about that our first night. 2 Samuel 7. God made a promise that one of your children will always sit on the throne forever. And David believed it when God said it. And so David prophesies resurrection will come one of his descendants. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. We just talked about that this morning. The eyewitnesses, at least 15 appearances, maybe more, over 500 people witnessed the resurrected Lord. This is the culmination of everything the Bible's been about, right? The resurrection was not only an actual fact, but it was the plan. This is what God always intended. Because he raised, what does that mean about Jesus? 
This really is the final point of the sermon, that God placed him as Christ or king. That's when he ascends to that throne. He humbled himself by becoming a human, becoming a servant, and dying for us. But he was raised to sit as king because of what he does, because he has the power of an indestructible life, to borrow from the Hebrew writer. That's what gives him his authority. But continue reading with me. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, he both died, was buried, his tomb is with us to this day. So because he was a prophet, a new God swore to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. He was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, note that for later, Jesus has already received the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured forth this, which you both see and hear, the tongue speaking, the miracle working. Because God gave the promise from the Holy Spirit to Jesus, and Jesus is now raised and he's king, that's why today's the day God's decided to pour out his spirit on the apostles. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Normally, a child is not above his parent. Usually the, the kid doesn't rule over the parent in a monarchy. That's just not how it works. But David, speaking of the future, said and referred to his long, long descendant as his Lord. And the Lord the Father said to my Lord, the Son, my future descendant, sit at my right hand. What's that final enemy we talked about in chapter 15 of, of 1 Corinthians? It's death. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And that's how he ends it. You killed him, but God made him king. So this is the same good news minus the good side, right? There's a little bit here. What do we do? Okay, yeah, I believe you, he's king. I believe you, the prophets talked about him. I believe you, he raised from the dead. I believe you guys are speaking truth. But what now? I want to go back and talk about what the Spirit did in this chapter. Uh, obviously, he proves the apostles are speaking God's word. Uh, anybody can get up and say anything. And before the written word where you can compare it to it, uh, the New Testament writers... A lot of people did claim to have new revelations from God. And so many passages tell us that that's part of the reason these, these spiritual gifts come along is to confirm that the speaker actually has authority to speak because they're doing things that only divinity could give you the power to do. Humans just can't speak in tongues. Now we can study and work hard and learn new languages, but we can't speak a language on the fly with zero training and zero listening, just, just like that, completely fluent. There's this cool guy that can listen to a language spoken, and uh, within like an hour, he can become conversational because he, he knows linguistics really well. It's cool. They've done some almost dead languages and done it. But even him, he has to study really, really hard. We're not talking about that. There's no natural ability to a language. These guys were just fishermen. No training. And they're speaking tongues. The Spirit was proving they are speaking for me. What else does the Spirit do? He inspires people like Joel and David in the Old Testament. And this passage is clear. The Spirit was speaking through them. And why do I believe the Old Testament? Because it's proven trustworthy. You get people like Isaiah who wrote 700 years before Jesus, and he exactly predicts the circumstances of his death, burial, and resurrection, and it happens just like he said. I can believe it. Someone like David who spoke even earlier, I can believe it. Moses even earlier. I mean, and they were 1,500 years removed from, from Moses. And all those prophecies, everything that's ever been talked about came true. You can believe the prophets. The Spirit did that. And while Jesus was on this earth, if you looked at him, you would not know he's the Son of God. Isaiah 53 is very clear about that. 
you look at his appearance and he looks like one of us. I've heard some people argue that it may, maybe he looked homely or ugly or something like that. I don't think that's the passage, what it means. I think that as you looked at Jesus, he would just seem like one of the crowd. His physical appearance, he would blend in. He probably had rough carpenter hands. He didn't wear expensive clothes. He had one nice piece of clothes he wore, and that was it. He looked like everybody else. He probably had the same skin tone as everyone else, the same haircut, the same eye color. He wasn't glowing white. Now, the time that happened, it was remarkable. It was crazy because suddenly he doesn't look like Jesus anymore. He looks like somebody special. Before that, he just looked like a man. So how are people going to know they follow Jesus? Because the Spirit gives him the power to do all these miracles while he's on the earth. So the Spirit's active. But what are we talking about when he says this promise is to you and those who are far off? I believe it's the promise that he made to the Messiah in the Old Testament and the promise he kept to the Messiah in the resurrection. Chapter 2 and verse 33, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured forth this which you both see in here. What promise was given? you got to go up to David's writings there. The promise is, I will not abandon my soul to Hades or allow your Holy One to undergo decay. He told Jesus, way before he came in the flesh, your body's not going to rot in the tomb. And he told Jesus, you're not going to stay in the place of departed spirits, the waiting place, long. And he told Jesus, you will not be abandoned and forsaken. I will remember you. He said, you're going to raise from the dead. That's the promise the Holy Spirit made to Jesus in the Old Testament, and he kept it in the resurrection. It's not that someday you'll learn how to speak tongues when God really did choose you. It's not that someday you can do miracles. And there's a, there's a Holy Spirit uh, incarnation light that people teach today. Well, the Holy Spirit put it on my heart to go here for a cheeseburger today, and that's why I met you. There's some people that talk about it as if God has micromanaged every decision of their life. And sometimes they'll go to the book of James and they'll say, you know, we ought to say if the Lord wills, we'll do this and that. That's not what that passage says. Did you ever notice that? I know I promised you I'd be in Acts 2 the whole time. You don't have to turn here so I can keep my promise, but I'm going to look in James 4. <laughs> James 4. Notice what's actually said in James 4, verse uh, 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, not we will do this, but if the Lord wills, we will live, and then we will do this. I'm in the firm camp of believing God has not predetermined every action of my life, but he has predetermined the day I'm going to die. So Lord willing, tomorrow I will live, and then I'll make my plans. And that's a difference. It wasn't the Lord's will that I woke up and had eggs for breakfast. It wasn't the Lord's will, uh, but it was the Lord's will that I lived today so that I could fulfill my plans to preach to you. We need to think about it biblically when we think about how God does it. Sorry about the rabbit trail, the, the side tangent here. But I think it's important. God made a promise that he would live. He would not undergo decay. And so he could be king. So important. This is what God has planned for us. And the Holy Spirit doesn't take over us and make us do things we don't want to do. The Holy Spirit doesn't take over us and, and um, now I can be righteous because he's taken over my body and I can be righteous. No, that's not how it works. The Holy Spirit works with our spirit. Now, does he empower us? Yes. Does he dwell in us? Yes. Does he work with us? Yes. Does he change us? Yes. But he doesn't make you do stuff you don't want to do. You have to get your will attuned to his will and then the Holy Spirit works with you. You see? He's a co-worker. He's not a master that controls us. Like a puppet. I'm not trying to mock somebody who says, well, if the Lord, you know, the, the Lord put it on my heart that I'm here to have this food today. Don't mock people for that. But just understand, God's will is, is, is bigger and, and more powerful. His will is that everyone live. 
His will is that everyone be saved. His will is that everybody put on Christ and live as a light for him. And some of the ways you choose to do that are, are within your realm to control. His promise made to Jesus that your flesh would not under, undergo decay, that you would not rot in the ground and just stay there forever, that's his promise that you also can have. You can probably know where I'm going with it because of the sermon title. The promise is you can have eternal life just like the Son. That he's the first fruits, he rose never to die again, and you can too. You know, Lazarus had to die again. The widow of Nain's son had to die again. Uh, the little girl, Jairus' daughter, 12-year-old girl, she had to die again. But when you raise from the dead, you will never die again. If you respond, he said, he said what do we do? What's that, what's that response, right? The promise was eternal life, of course. But what was the message? When they asked Peter, what do we do? Think about it. Do you believe the things I'm going to put up on this screen? Do you believe that your sins put him to death on the cross? Now, literally, in the audience hearing this, some of them were there. They were the fickle crowd that on Sunday, the children danced in the streets and said, Hosanna. They laid their coats down. They put the palm leaves down. And they said, yeah. We believe you. Be our king. But by the end of the week, they said, his blood be upon us and our children. And there were probably people in the crowd who uttered those words. His blood be upon us and our children. His blood be upon us and our children. And they realized what they said. And 50 days later, they are pierced to the heart. Now, you may not have been in that crowd, but if you are guilty of sin... Your sins put him there. Do you believe that? If you do, the solution offered for them is the same solution offered for you. What does he say in Acts 2, 38? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. He makes it clear. He could have said anything. He could have said, say this little prayer that's been printed in the back of your Bible, uh, accept it in your heart, have a burning feeling after you say a prayer. He could have said, uh, when your baby's born, sprinkle water on his head. He could have said anything he wanted. But he didn't. This is what he said, and it's repeated all throughout the book of Acts. It's repeated all throughout the epistles. God's plan hasn't changed. Now, I've met some people that are baptized and didn't repent. Some of those are babies. What do you have to repent from? You're just born. You gave your mom heartburn? That's not a sin, right? There's, there's no sin in a baby. They're born perfectly pure and innocent. But they've got to repent. So this means they've done something wrong. This is not a young child who doesn't know right and wrong. Yeah, they're naughty, but they don't know the difference. They have to be taught the difference. Repentance is change. So I met people who were baptized, and they didn't repent. I've even met adults who felt bad about the message of the gospel and decided to be baptized. But you know what happened when they came up out of the water? Nothing. And their life was no different. They, they had the same friends. They watched the same stuff, listened to the same music, wore the same clothes. Uh, <laughs> partied the same way they ever did, had all the same friends they always did, said the same bad words they did always. There's people that are baptized and don't change a thing. That doesn't work. I've met people who repented, but for whatever reason refused to be baptized. I had an old high school friend that moved in with me and lived with me for a while. And this is the one point he, he could not come to agreement on. I brought him to a passage like 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Baptism now saves you. He says, I guess we've got to look in the Greek to see what baptism means. Maybe it's Holy Spirit baptism. I said, there's water in the passage. Well, that was for them. But he taught the same thing everywhere in every church. Well, we'll talk about it later. He hasn't called me. You, you can't ignore what's right in front of you. Baptism. Until we know what it is. Acts 8, they went down into the water. 
Romans 6, it was a burial. You don't sprinkle dirt on top of someone to bury them. It gets stinky pretty fast. You bury them. That word uh, for immerse was used to dye garments, and tie-dye wasn't invented yet. They dyed purple garments all the way under. They used it for washing dishes. You don't sprinkle water and a dish is clean. You submerge it in the water. To be baptized is to go under the water and to completely die to self. That's what repentance is. You're living for Christ. You got to have both. Repent and be baptized. And what do we see after this? They are a changed people. Completely changed. Their behavior is different, right? Look at some of the things it says about them when they were added to the church. In verse 41, those who received the word were baptized that day. They were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. All those who had believed were together, had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions, were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor for all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Their lives were completely upended and changed. They were different people. Every day they were different people. Because not only were they baptized, but repentance went along with it. The solution to the problem of me putting Jesus on the cross is bow down to the king and do what the king said. So what will happen if we do? We can receive that same promise, eternal life. And I want everyone here to have it. And everyone listening afar off, who's going to hear on YouTube someday, I want you to hear it too. I want you to have eternal life. But it only happens if you respond to the gospel. He called out to you. you got to call back to him. Call on the name of the Lord. And so the question is, have you repented? Are you even willing to acknowledge that there's some things in your life that have got to go? And if you're willing to repent, are you willing to be baptized? Have you been baptized? God tells us that's where those spiritual blessings start. That's where the cleaning starts. That's where the new life changes. And I just got to say, if not, why not? There, it's not a very confusing passage. If you have come to believe that the things that Peter and the other apostles preached in this passage are true, and if you want the promise of the Holy Spirit to have eternal life, not undergo decay permanently, but yet to live eternally. Then this is the time. If there's some way we can help you, if you need to respond to the gospel call in any way, let us know how we can help as we stand and sing.
come before you, most high and holy. Our God, our Father in heaven, our creator, you are magnificent and wondrous. We're so grateful that we have your word, Father, and so grateful for the blessing that it has been to listen to these lessons presented by your servant, Jeremy, of your word, so that we may, in turn, present your word to others. Help us, Father, to take advantage of all those opportunities you set before us, Father. We are your servants, and I know, we know, that you are working diligently to make sure that we are put to good use. Help us not to have fear and to be courageous and to speak and to listen and to help others come to know your son, Christ Jesus. We pray that you would continue to bless us. We pray for the work that's being done where Jeremy preaches there in Portage. We pray for the work in all the congregations of your people in all the places, Father. Bless us, look over us, help us to do good. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.